Connections Radio Show, where we talk about ideas that matter. I'm so glad you've made the connection today and you're with us. I'm Lori Fitz, your host. And as you know, the goal of our show is to explore a wide range of topics that challenge us to think and feel and imagine and take the world in around us and get us thinking, get us connected, maybe even inspired and thinking about new ways of thinking. And that's part of what we want to talk about today. We've got Full Circle Theater, which is one of my um, favorite theaters these days. It's one of my, uh, I've adopted this theater as one of my favorites. They're doing really cool work that explores a wide range of issues. And they do it in creative and interesting ways. And I have Rick Shiomi joining me today. He's the co-artistic director of Full Circle Theater. Welcome. Thank you. I'm great. so happy to be here. Oh, I'm glad that you are, too. You've got um, an interesting show coming up called Caught. It's going to be at the Guthrie and in the Dowling Center. Uh, I read it uh, the last few days and found it totally engaging. It reminds me of Ionesco. It reminds me of Pinter. Um, and it's very present and very multicultural um, and helps us confront, I think, uh, what we believe is true. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was my, my reaction, too. It has, um, it takes you on a journey. Uh, was there, you had mentioned to me that you had done this, uh, for, it was this your, the opening of the first time that it was the, done? The world you premiere. Were the, the world premiere. Right. I, I directed the world premiere production of this play um, in Philadelphia at mm-hmm. the Interact Theater there. And... Uh, I was first sent the play by the artistic director there, Seth Rosen, mm-hmm. and as you said, um, I loved it. Mm-hmm. I just thought it was brilliant. Mm-hmm. And um, it was so, to me, such a wonderful combination of insight, serious insight, and humor. And uh, uh, some of the scenes I, I often describe as torturously funny um, because you are taken on this journey, as you say, taken on this saga um, that you don't know where it's going. But it's funny and thrilling at the same time. And and it's filled with discoveries that both the uh, folks on stage get to make and folks in the audience get to make, which I think is great. Absolutely. It, absolutely. It, it has a certain unpredictability that um, uh, I think when we first produced it, we were wondering whether audiences would would like that or not. Because some audiences don't like changes. Well, they like predictability. They yeah. want. They know when they go to see a show that there's a certain, a certain set of comfort. rules. Yeah, and, certain- and you know, you follow the rules and you understand what's going to happen. And it, and disrupting that can sometimes be um, challenging. Absolutely. And so we were wondering, are audiences going to like this or not? And they loved it. Good. So Good. that was great. Um, and the very first thing that happens is that we change the as you say, rules of engagement for play Mm -hmm. by having the audience enter the theater and go onto the stage of the theater. And on the stage of the theater is a a visual art exhibit. And it's the visual art exhibit of the Chinese dissident artist, Lin Bo. So what's fun about that is that you you have two different art disciplines that are going on and, and two sets of rules. Absolutely. There's the set of rules when you go into a gallery that you may be more contemplative. Mm-hmm. You might take things in in a more slow and, and and at the same time the theater audience is ready for, you know, some action. action. Yeah, the action, exactly. <laughs> what is it gonna get going? And, and, What's up? And in a way, um, the the performers are controlling the tempo of the action mm-hmm. as opposed mm-hmm. to in an art gallery. Mm-hmm. Each individual audience person is controlling their own tempo. Mm-hmm. They can s- look at a picture as long as they want. And, and it works also as literary. I mean, I could imagine that even from reading the page. But there's this lovely tension and also balance for when you are almost forced to contemplate. Absolutely. You, there, it, that it takes the beauty of the visual art and puts it in your face to think. Um, and and all the things that I love about going to the art crawl or going to an art gallery of taking it in, I've never had an experience where there's also this theater layer that can come in and have just as much action going on. So it's almost like the two are coexisting. Totally, totally melded together mm-hmm. in that sense. And so, and and in that sense, that's what is sometimes and initially confusing and disorienting for the audience. Because I remember some of the first people that came to the show in Philadelphia, they walked in and they said, 
is this where the play is? Uh-huh. You know, because they were a play. I'm supposed to sit down and wait for the actors, right? But they're asking me to walk around on stage with all this artwork. And we're told not to get on the stage. And we're told not to set. Exactly. Not Audiences to set. should not be there, right? And we've learned that rule. Exactly. So we feel awkward. But on the other hand, we only know that we've broken. We only know that there's a rule when we've broken it. Yes. So we don't want to break the rule. Yes. But we're being invited to break rules. Exactly. Throughout the play. Exactly. And question into our rules. Exactly. And how we've created these rules. And what are these rules. Exactly. And can we change the rules? Uh, and are we ready to change the rules or even see that they are rules? Right. And so all of these questions come up in this play, in Uh this experience Uh of this play. And that's what so that I felt was so exciting and so much fun. Well, as you're doing it this time, you're bringing it here to the Twin Cities. Are you doing it differently? Um, uh, No, I think the play is really, you know, we have a different cast, of course. And so actors themselves impact how a performance goes. Um, uh, but I'm excited about our cast. Uh, we have Brian Kim, who's coming in from uh, 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 New York, but he's originally, like you, a Minnesotan. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have Katie Bradley, who's been a longtime uh, Asian-American actor in the Twin Cities. So we have a really n- nice cast. And we also um, have uh, three people, three actors, who are going to be serve as the docents mm. for the art exhibit and so they're going to help the audience and they know the art they know the art they're going to be trained in in what the stories behind each of the pieces are and things like that so that's all going to be part of the experience so as docents might it be different each night with questions that may get asked totally it could be totally different Mm. and you know we feel like the docents can have their own personal opinions mm. about the art so so the audience can can experience a wide range of thoughts gregory yang you are joining us today yes. also and you are an actor and you were playing an understudy uh, for limbo i am yes what what about the character of limbo just triggers excitement in you what what is it about limbo that you like it's so funny we talked about uh, about truth being a very big um uh, a really big element in the show. The and exploration. Of yeah, the exploration of truth. And sometimes you kind of just wonder, like, what is the truth of Limbo? Mm-hmm. There's there's still moments where I'm trying to answer that question. Uh, the complexity of this character is really, really is interesting to me. And, and does he even know? Or is he just playing a game? Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, 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 that's, and that's the discoveries I cannot wait to get started on. We you know, start diving into rehearsals right here. But... But walking into uh, the rehearsal, um, the audition room for for um, this production, it it blew my mind. Just knowing, I guess, essentially, Limbo being the face mm-hmm. of this of this game of this mm-hmm. of this rule break rule breaking piece of theater adventure. Yeah, and the audience gets to join right on and and wonder if this is okay what they're doing and if, if this is if this is really happening yeah. or what's really happening with the show and it's. And I and I can't wait to just get involved and and, and navigate through this wonderland of truth or mm-hmm. lies. So. And what I love about the play is the characters are so complex. Yes, mm. they're so mm. multi-layered. Yes. And so, on what level are we dealing with mm-hmm. them? And what mm-hmm. level are they dealing with us? Mm-hmm. And so it's such a, a wonderful piece that way. In addition to the character Limbo as well, too. It's always like, uh, especially when we try to show uh, as. As Asian artists, when we do try to show our art to the um, to the Western world, it's mm-hmm. always confound with um, with the struggles of being Asian or the struggles mm-hmm. of being a minority as well too. And I think this piece really reflects on that because it it shows you know because in that yes. yeah in that sense it's a very Asian American play yes. mm-hmm. while still looking at some national international issues, mm-hmm. but. At the heart of it is still there's still very deep issues of Asian American uh, identity and issues kind of thing. Mm-hmm. What I loved is I as I was pulled into the story because it is a little bit like a a roller coaster where you're going up and then all of a sudden there's twists and turns and it takes you everywhere. That's right. uh, but one of the things that I, I was enamored by was the idea that there's a sense of rules in art. There's a sense of rules in journalism. There's a sense of rules in culture. And how do these all intersect? And in the intersection of each, there's discoveries. And uh, you get pulled into a storyline that 
you embrace and you're fully there. And then all of a sudden, whoop, <laughs> your neck turns quick. And you're in another room. Yes. 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 It almost and feels like you're in another show, essentially. Another show. Too. Yeah, it's like what? I'm in another show. And yet, and yet they tie, and yet they and they, they parallel, they try, and yet exactly. they reflect. And in some ways, yeah. you feel like you're in a prism yeah. where it just the light got refracted in a different way, and you just mm-hmm. went off in that direction for a bit. But then you come back. Exactly, and 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 that's that's the beauty of the writing is that it it flows. It's mm-hmm. connected. You don't feel a disjointed. Oh, this doesn't make sense. That it doesn't go with that, or right. this a, a doesn't go with B. Doesn't go with see but no in your matter. mind's always thinking yes it's mm-hmm. always trying to figure out the puzzle think. That's what, right. what's the next puzzle exactly. that you're putting in now i don't want to have the audience get scared like sometimes people go oh do i have to go someplace and they're going to make me talk <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they're going to talk at me no there's it's still a very safe place to oh, explore yes. art yes. You, you will be entertained yeah it's you very will be funny. taken on a journey yes. you will laugh you might pause and maybe even have a tear <laughs> mm-hmm. uh because it, some things might hit you that you didn't even realize it was going to hit you that yeah. way, but it's 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 a journey of also self exploration. Right? Who are we? What do we want? How do we hold ourselves accountable? How do we create? And how do we view others? Yes. You know, in terms of how do we think of them initially, and then how do we think of them after we learn something else about them, and mm-hmm. how do we think about them when we get to the third layer of understanding? Right. And the thing that I again for audiences is that. People love this play because yeah. it's so engaging and so entertaining and so much fun. But at the same time, as you say, you're constantly thinking yes. mm-hmm. and evaluating. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, in our next segment, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the cultural appropriations and how that plays into it. Because it's also uh, something that I think we need to, to talk about in your other play that you're doing. So Absolutely. We'll be right back after a few short announcements. And you're listening to AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. And we're on Connections Radio Show. And we'll be right back. Chances are there'll never be an emergency ever again. But just in case, let's talk about a plan. Okay. Who is going to grab the go bag? What's a go bag? It is a bag we do not have that is filled with things we really, really need in an emergency. Guess we won't have to worry about it then. Well, this is great. (laughs) I am so glad that we don't have a plan. I know. Winging it is not an emergency plan. Make sure your kids know what to do during an emergency. Who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. Fearless Five Noir. Five original short plays by five different writers and five directors all on the same topic. Noir. Follow these clues. St. Paul. Fridays and Saturdays, February 8th through the 23rd at 7.30 p.m. Tickets 10 bucks if you gumshoe to the website and order at fearlesscomedyproductions.com or a deal at 15 bucks at the door. Fearless Five Noir on February 8th through the 23rd at 7.30 p.m. at the Mounds Theater. Presented by Fearless Comedy Productions. Hey, it's Brett from our new 4 p.m. show, the Minnesota Progressive Ray Parte, and I'd like to invite you to another Ray Parte of sort. It's the 2019 Blue State Ball. This will actually be the fourth Blue State Ball I've attended, and I'm really looking forward to this year's. Why? Well, because after living through some tough times of the Donald Trump election and a Republican Congress, we finally turned the tide last November with the Blue Wave. So come celebrate all your hard work last year of door knocking and getting out the vote at the Blue State Ball on Saturday, March 2nd at the Blaisdale in Minneapolis. I'll be there along with my Minnesota Progressive Ray Partey co-hosts Doug Padgett, Hunter Haas, Matt McNeil, Ellie Krug, and Robert Pilot will be there, and so will our headliner, Tom Hartman. Plus, we're sure to add many more speakers and politicians in the coming weeks. As always, attire is blue jeans to ball gowns. So let's party at the Blue State Ball on Saturday, March 2nd at the Blaisdale and celebrate that blue wave. Tickets available now at am950radio.com. That's am950radio.com. The stage is set with a motionless tableau, the actors frozen in mid-action, their faces conjuring up an ancient freeze. At the snap of fingers, the spell is broken. The statues spring to life and Antigone begins. Park Square Theater presents Antigone on stage February 1st through March 3rd. A reimagined adaptation of this classic Greek drama explores civil disobedience, fidelity, and a family torn apart by pride. This electric production brings the action directly on stage with an all-female cast playing the roles. The battles between the laws of the gods and the laws of the people rages. Who is right when all are certain? What are you willing to die for? Be a part of this epic event at Park Square Theater in St. Paul. Tickets and more at parksquaretheater.org. 
That's parksquaretheater.org. Today we're talking about Full Circle Theater's two productions coming up. One is called Caught by Christopher Chen, and later on we'll be talking about The Mikado, which is also going to be produced by Full Circle Theater. If you want to learn more about Full Circle Theater, I encourage you to go to their website. It's fullcircletheatermn.org. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. Um, the Mikado is being produced by the Gilbert and Sullivan ah, Light Opera Company. Ah, thank you. So thank it's you. my individual directing of that piece. There we go. So, so we're doing both Full Circle Theater and... and Gilbert we're, and Sullivan Very Light Opera Company. Wonderful. We'll be talking about I'm that. Sorry in, about no, 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 no. Yeah. That That's fine. I I just know that you're the co-executive director of the Full Circle Theater. Court, <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. And I just put the two and two yeah, together. Yeah. So all is I'm good. Sorry. All is good. But we are finishing up talking about Cot. Um, last segment we shared about this adventure uh, that combines um, an art gallery and a performance and breaks some rules and takes us on an adventure of discovery and learning. One of the things that we talked about in that first segment was the idea of cultural appropriations and Asian American theater and some of uh, the assumptions that we make and I I really appreciate how Christopher Chen in this work um, puts it right in our face. Uh, in terms of how we uh, even look at journalistic versus artistic truth, um, but they're both stories. Absolutely. They're both stories that we've made up that have conventions and rules that help us understand the world, but do they sometimes continue a myth that isn't real? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit more about how you are exploring that cultural appropriations. Um. To me, uh, the the issue of cultural appropriations is is such a a, a wide ranging uh, issue, mm-hmm. and you know there are simply cases where uh, uh, artists from one culture, from in some way cases the dominant culture, just create something um, that is a broad stereotype mm-hmm. of of a. Uh, another culture mm. in a sense and and if you look and th- at the westerns you know the, way, the we, westerns we, absolutely we had the cowboys and the yeah, indians, indians were yeah, always played absolutely. and there was the the ethnic yeah, actor that exactly. could play whatever role because exactly. they were just sort of the other exactly. ethnic yes. and they're and they are yeah. writing you know their the the native story yeah. uh, from the western cowboy perspective mm-hmm. and so it's it's never going to be really accurate or or, or understanding so or i think sensitive. That the, or sensitive all those all those issues that we are you know that have sort of enraged the the, mm-hmm. the communities of color and native communities in a sense and so so all of that is is there and um, I think uh, in this play in Caught uh, Chris explores some of those issues um, through talking about uh, the the issue with Mike Daisy as mm-hmm. a performer talking about issues in China and how sometimes things got elaborated or or blown out a little uh, differently than they might have truly been and and all the issues he encountered with that and but also other journalists as you say you're in radio and mm-hmm. you're in journalism and and when journalists uh, may or may not. Uh, 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 may distort something well the or, challenge or, i think sometimes is even the medium itself requires everything to be down into a, a time so you have to speak your truth in a minute on some of these national news updates and how can you get to complexity exactly. of, of in, nuance in the, and yeah. ideas and and issues where you just have to have a point of view tell the story and that becomes truth yes, yes. Exactly. and it's accepted as truth yeah. Yeah. with the one minute soundbite that Absolutely. that captured the essence, but it's just someone's choice to capture that part of the essence, mm. right? Which and is what I I absolutely was enamored by when that was brought up. Yes, you know, we we accept, you know, although we, I think we're doing a better job of questioning into yeah. it, yeah, um, of what is yeah. uh, points of view as we become more partisan. Exactly, and there's and there's that uh, double thing of one certainly. We already know the issues of creation of mm-hmm. art that mm-hmm. is appropriating the voices of of other cultures and things like that. But there's also the interpretation of art, yes, and the evaluation of art that done by a certain perspective from one culture 
may negatively evaluate the work of another culture, in a sense. And so that Because that they're operating with, here are the rules. Values, and values rules. and yeah. rules. Yes. Of, this is what we've agreed that exactly. makes good art. art. Exactly. And so along these lines of these rules, it doesn't match or it does yeah. something else. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we don't know what to do with it if it doesn't fit the rules. Right, mm -hmm. right, exactly. And so, so there's many sort of layers to this issue of cultural appropriation. Well, and it, it came, um, I thought about the cultural appropriations in terms of cowboys and Indians mm -hmm. and how terrible, you know, the, creating that. But then also thinking about recently that young man who invaded the space of the Native American who was yes. singing his song. Mm -hmm. And he's not apologizing because within his uh, set of rules, he has every right to be in someone's face. Mm -hmm. But totally insensitive to the elder and to the culture of the Native Americans that that, that is not okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do we share? And, and I, I, one of the questions in the play that I was, you know, is it okay to find out about someone else's culture? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? And mm -hmm. is it, and, and there was an, a sense can, of can intentionality. You, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and with, with that issue of intentionality, is it even possible? Right. to understand the values of another culture mm -hmm. because is it possible to 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 drop your own set of values as you say some mm -hmm. of the questions you say are are can we know what the rules are even ourselves of our own culture and if we don't know that how can we drop them and if we can't drop them how can we evaluate another culture or another set because of values. Because we still have the lens. Exactly. The How lens we, is still there. The filter that That's we right. grew up, the filters are there. So is there a need for an intentionality yes. that allows us to at least make a bridge? Yeah. If not understand, yeah. you know, is there a bridge that's created? Is it possible? Yes. And, and that's and a I good like, question. I, and I don't know. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I spend a lot of time working right. in multicultural because I'm fascinated. Mm -hmm. But it, even in that process, it's that self-awareness of mm -hmm. can I look at the box, inside the box, outside mm -hmm. the box? Yeah. You know, are all of those things coming at me and how can I... Uh, if right. nothing else, just push them away mm -hmm. in order to be open to it. At one point, there is uh, in that I also like in the writing is that you have to get lost. That's okay. If you're getting lost, that's a good that's a good sign. Yeah. And if you've gotten yeah. lost, maybe that's where you can find something new. Right. Cause because you're giving you up. Oh, right. You're giving up the things that you hold on to that you think protect yourself, mm -hmm. but in fact are blocking you from understanding. Mm -hmm. And those ex and you can talk about that in a lecture and you can yeah. see it, but suddenly experiencing it in yeah. a theatrical experience, I think will be very powerful. Right. That's what I think so. Um, and, and, uh, I, that whole issue of intentionality, as you say, that is that the very intentionality of our company, Full mm -hmm. Circle Theater, mm -hmm. is is really about can we intentionally sort of understand each other, people from different mm -hmm. cultural backgrounds, racial backgrounds, who who are trying to work together and and support each other and understand each other. And, you know, this is the great experiment of of America. Um, uh, it's been full of of problems and challenges mm -hmm. and, and huge issues but i feel like we're heading somewhere at least we're trying we're trying to mm -hmm. head somewhere uh, and and we're confronting each other and we have the opportunity to confront because we have differences and i think something that we should celebrate yes. that we have differences oh absolutely uh, but not to create you know one to, the goal should not be to create just a, a sameness right. but to celebrate right. that we're always going to be challenging ourselves to something new yes. Uh, yes. as we keep bringing in and continue to bring in um, more more of our country yeah. uh, I, I want our country to grow yes. I, I want more immigrants mm -hmm. I, I want us to continue our journey yes. of understanding the growth, democracy the growth and evolution is so important well with that We'll get back to our next segment after a few short commercials. And in that one, we'll be talking about the Mikado. So stay with us. Mm. It's 6.42 p.m. Time for Steve Plato and his son Dylan to do the dishes. They talk about everything from the yuckiness of girls to the awesomeness of his soccer team. Sometimes they don't talk at all. Then, hey! the <laughs> dreaded splash fight. It's dad o'clock, and it's the best time of the day. Because the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. 
Tom Hartman here letting you know how you can go solar with all energy solar, even way up north in Minnesota. Lots of people ask them, isn't Minnesota too cloudy for solar? No. The truth, for one thing, Minneapolis gets nearly as much sun each year as Houston, Texas. But it isn't just about how much sun you get. It's also about having access to great local incentive programs that make solar affordable. Learn what your options are to save with solar and visit allenergysolar.com today. It was a day like any other when she walked into my office and told me about Fearless Five Noir. A collection of five original short plays by five different writers and five directors, all on the same topic, noir. It just sounded so crazy that it was a hard pill to swallow, even for a hard-boiled detective like me. But I wasn't going to let that stop me. I knew exactly where I could find them, too. They'd be at the Mounds Theater at 1029 Hudson Road in St. Paul. They'd be there Fridays and Saturdays, February 8th through the 23rd at 7.30 p.m. Tickets would be 10 bucks if I planned ahead and ordered them online, or 15 bucks at the door. She told me that I could always find more information at fearlesscomedyproductions.com. I took the job, but are you up for helping me with this case? I guess we'll find out at Fearless 5 Noir on February 8th through the 23rd at 7.30 p.m. at the Mounds Theater. Presented by Fearless Comedy Productions. Brighten your winter with an optimistic tribute to the invincible human spirit. Girl Friday Productions presents Thornton Wilder's Pulitzer Prize-winning classic, The Skin of Our Teeth. The Skin of Our Teeth plays February 7th through March 3rd. Fresh, unexpected, and very funny, this tale is surprisingly relevant for today. Follow the trials of an eternal American family residing in prehistoric and contemporary New Jersey. They survive the Ice Age, the Great Flood, World War, and family strife, all with their hope intact. Joel Sass directs this large cast production on stage at Park Square Theater. The Skin of Our Teeth previews begin February 7th with opening night February 9th. Don't miss The Skin of Our Teeth, a comedy of epic proportions. Oh, did we mention the dinosaur? Visit parksquaretheater.org for tickets. With your AM 950 weather, I'm Hunter Hawes. Friday, mostly sunny and cold with a high near 4. Saturday, partly sunny with a high near 11. And Sunday, chance of snow, partly sunny with a high near 8. This week's Eat Local Minnesota.com Restaurant of the Week is Hazel's Northeast. They have classically inspired, creatively prepared comfort food. For dinner, enjoy dishes like their Swedish meatballs, pesto chicken, fish and chips, and more. Located at 29th and Johnson in Northeast Minneapolis, find out more at EatLocalMinnesota.com. radio show. little Mikado to get us started in our third segment here. We're glad you've made the connection and are joining us today. I'm Lori Fitz, your host, and I have Rick Shiomi, who is the, co-execu- the co-artistic director of uh, Full Circle Theater, but he is doing a directing uh, opportunity this spring with the uh, Gilbert and Sullivan Little... Very light opera. Very light, very light opera. And they just do... Uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, is that correct? Yes. And tell me a little background about how you started to work with the Mikado and their interest in bringing you to presu- pre- to present uh, or to direct um, their show this summer, this spring. Um, well, it happened a number of years ago um, when I was first approached originally by um, the Skylark Opera Company um, when I was the artistic director at Theatre Moo. And so uh, they originally wanted to collaborate on the traditional version of the Mikado. And, Mm -hmm. um, of course, for Asian-American theater artists, the Mikado is one of the uh, 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 evil pieces of uh, Japanese or Asian stereotyping. And so uh, I was a bit surprised, taken aback by the idea. Mm -hmm. Um, But I started to do some research on it and uh, uh, realized that... um, this could be an opportunity to uh, actually make some changes to this uh, uh, operetta this, that might deal with some of these issues. Um, and so uh, what happened is 
a couple of things. One is I discovered that, in fact, the Mikado went into public domain in the early 2000s. Ooh. So, like that about, opens it up, doesn't that, it? Totally. So suddenly you can play with it. Uh-huh. Um, so that was one issue. The other was um, I talked with some people, um, and uh, one of them, uh, 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 Professor Lee um, at uh, the University of Minnesota, had written a book. Um, about the Mikado and the many, many versions of it. Mm -hmm. And so then I thought, uh, how to deal with this issue of culture appropriation of of the Japanese culture? Um, And uh, I realized that we could set it in England, and I would set it in Edwardian England. Uh And then, but then to do that, I had to look at the script, the lyrics, um, to think about how would we, how could I make these adjustments? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so it, fortunately, it, it came along. Now, the Mikado, the reason folks feel uncomfortable is that it, it feels insulting. So how do you take something that has created a cultural wound, that's insulting, that does not seem to respect, and create the respect through this piece? Um I am not exactly sure about creating the respect. Uh-huh. I'm more sure about removing the stereotypes. Oh, good. And so, uh, removing the Japanese stereotypes by mm-hmm. resetting it in England. Mm-hmm. Um, flipping it. Flipping it. <laughs> yeah. Because, in fact, uh, many people think that the Gilbert and Sullivan operettas were really, many of them were critiques of British society and British institutions. And the safer they were in being able to critique is the farther away that they could get from. (laughs) Exactly. And at the time, for them, um, there was a lot of interest in Japanese culture in England. So they kind of melded those two things, and it was kind of, at that time, it was kind of a a wonderful fit for them. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, 130 years later, not such a good fit, Right. right? And so then we are looking at that. Because it imposes. Yeah, it imposes all these cultural kind of stereotypes mm-hmm. um, uh, in, in, in the, pl- in the so play. So two-dimensional. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so um, by, ch- by resetting it in England, we get actually to allow Gilbert and Sullivan to do their critique of British society the way they <laughs> wished it, they could have done it back in the day, right? Yeah. Um, Let's give them permission to go ahead exactly. and, and, and make their critique, make their case. Case, exactly. Yeah. And uh, so once I was able to do that, it was like just a lot of fun. Like some of the first things I did were change the name, some of the names. So I, mm-hmm. you know, that obnoxious name of Nanki Poo, that's yeah. the young hero, right? Yeah. I changed it to Frankie Poo because I got, ah. kept thinking of American, you know, pop idols. Sure. So, sure. so Frankie Poo became, oh, so, so nicely uh, uh, adapted to the, to the needs of the script and the lyrics. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of those kinds of things started happening. Then I started because. Um, uh, we could have fun with it, we started to be able to layer in some other more contemporary things, um, like cell phones and, and <laughs> DNA and, and things like that into it that, that audiences today enjoy. Because even as they're seeing this kind of classic story uh, 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 set in Edward in England, 1910 kind of thing, um, they're still fun to have contemporary references and things like that. Well, there, there's some similarities between Caught and this one in, in the surprise element and uh, going against convention. Exactly. And, and discovering what you can do when you uh, take a look at it differently. Right, exactly. And so so with that, um, uh, Stephen Haig, who's the uh, uh, executive director at the Gilbert and Sullivan Company, um, He's seen that production that we did uh, at Skylark and Skylark and, and Theater Moo, and he was interested in whether I would be interested in having that production done again, uh, basically with their company. Um, the difference this time, though, is that with the Skylark and Theater Moo company, we did an extra twist by having Asian American actors play the leads. It was kind of yes. like. One of those tweaking the nose. Uh, again? Reversal. <laughs> reverse, again, another reversal, right? Just like Go in against Cot. the expectations. Exactly, yes. going yes. against the expectations. But this time, I really wanted to see if I could work with the Gilbert and Sullivan Company's ensemble and, and actors and, and singers um, because my feeling is that this company in the Twin Cities is a company that many other companies around uh, the country and some companies internationally, like in, in the United Kingdom, actually watch their work. Mm. And so 
it's not just this production. It's like what is the impact that this production might have on those companies because they are now still doing the Mikado at some point, mm -hmm. and maybe this version of it can open up their uh, minds and, and open up their attitudes about what's possible so that they don't have to deal with all of the sort of Baggage. Messy baggage yeah. issues that happened, and and just like a couple of years ago, what happened in Seattle, the the local company tried to do the traditional version of it, and the Asian American community in Seattle just was outraged. Well, it's painful it's, because it 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 doesn't directly mock, but it no. doesn't respect. Yeah, it doesn't respect, and it's it's such so, and they're having so much fun in some ways at the expense of yes. the the Japanese culture kind yes. of thing, and so so that's a painful thing. And and it creates a backlash in a sense. Um, but you're bringing a new. You're reinventing. You're reimagining it, and it's almost like you're bringing it to the party. You know, because there's, yes. there's other folks that are viewing it besides the Twin Cities audience. Yes. To see if this could be a reimagined version that we can embrace versus feel uncomfortable by. Because yes. I'm sure that there's many. It's there's so many wonderful pieces to it, but you you avoid doing it because it has this sort of. Ugh, well, I don't want to be insulting, and yeah. there's you know is. I, we don't want to be producing something that's considered racist, yes. you know, and and disrespectful. Exactly. But and how so, to bring that art back to a, a, something that can be embraced and, and excited about? Exactly. And, and for me, um, what I discovered is I love the 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 music and I love the <laughs> comedy and the, love the humor. Uh -huh. In it, it almost it uh, strikes you. me. It, it, it's it's the early version of Monty Python. Oh my goodness! In a way, right? Sure, sure. And and so it's like I, I just you can appreciate the actual brilliance of the material, minus all the baggage. Mm -hmm. And so so why not in that sense? And and so I feel like that's what was so a big discovery for me. Rather than thinking, oh, this is an old-fashioned operetta, and, and who cares, and, and the humor is outdated. No, it's it's all actually uh, very uh, uh, a lot of fun uh, with some contemporary elements. It's 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 interesting, um, and 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 so there's for me there's there's so many exciting things about it. Once you get rid of those baggage things. And so when does it open? It opens uh, March 15th. Oh, so it's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. Yeah. I'm in rehearsal right now. Oh, are you? And it is going to be at the uh, Howard Kahn Fine Arts Center at 1900 Nicollet Avenue South. It's at the Plymouth uh, uh, Congregation. Oh, terrific. Um, and uh, uh, we are so just started rehearsals and, and it's been fun. Right. Now, would you ever have this be considered a, a touring opportunity? Would this be something that folks uh, um, take someplace else? Um, I don't think so because it's a cast of 30 people. Sure. That <laughs> makes it a little tricky. A little tricky, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. and, um, uh, and there are so many, like, hundreds of Gilbert mm -hmm. Sullivan companies mm -hmm. around North America. So it's more that... If people are interested in it, they will take this version and do their own production of it. And it. and I would be and and the 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 fun thing is that by the time we had finished the Skylark and Theater Moo production, I realized that this version that I created had enough changes that I checked with the Library of Congress and I actually got the copyright. Oh my goodness. My own copyright oh, for my wonderful? version of it. And not that I'm trying to make money although you and never like, know. You know? <laughs> but, but I would really like to, to, to if people want to use it, to, to know that, that my name is, is involved because it was a creation that I... It was this particular adaptation. Uh -huh. But I know also all these companies could create their own adaptation. Because sure, sure. now they can have that freedom. They have the freedom. Yeah. Well, let's hear a little bit more from um, your piece that you've created. You've taken the music, but you've rewritten some of the words? Some of the lyrics. Like okay. for, you know, in this particular one... The, the ensemble is singing this uh, gentleman of England and they talk about pubs and bars and, and Italian marionettes and, and mugs of beer. And so it's really, you know, I really uh, uh, wanted to um, embrace that, that classic uh, British uh, uh, sensibility. cultural world. Sensibility. And, yeah. and so in the opening, I have the, the, the ensemble come out and they're playing cricket. Oh, fun. And so it's just like, it's fun. Exactly. That's exactly the response that 
I feel and, and I think the audience will feel. And it's nice to take something that um, we hear the music and we kind of cringe at first. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like, oh, yeah, there's yeah, that yeah. Mikado. Oh, yeah, and, ooh, yeah, exactly. yeah, they're not really culturally sensitive. Exactly. <laughs> we, and this is like, no, we're, we're, we're now going to take it where it really needed to go originally. And that is, you know, some of the charm and craziness and Monty Python, the early roots of, of even Shakespeare's yes. crazy comedy of exactly. crackfalls and, exactly. and, and, and clever wit and repartee. Mm -hmm. But, you know, own it. That's our culture. You right. Know, own the culture yeah. amongst the, the the English that are, are... But why impose it onto another culture and then it feels like it's making fun of the other yes. instead of uh, make, poking fun at our own foibles, yes. at our own set of crazy rules right. that we create. Exactly. Exactly. And in and, and such a clever and, and insightful way uh, for Gilbert and Sullivan. I want to make sure the audience knows if you're um, interested as I am about seeing the show, you can go to their website for the Gilbert and Sullivan and it's gsvloc.org. Uh, I'm going to give that to you again, gsvloc.org. I also wanted to let you know that Connections Radio website has been updated and we have a new website, uh, uh, the... the <laughs> title of our website is that what you call Isn't it, it? connectionsradio.com <laughs> yes yes our new one is connectionsradiomin.com and we also have uh, connections radio on facebook so if you take a little time out of your facebook browsing and check us out and give us a like we would really appreciate that we're going to be coming right back after a couple commercials, and we're going to be recapping how to go see this very cool Gilbert and Sullivan Very Light Opera Company produce their Makata, which has uh, been directed by our friend Rick Shiomi, and we'll also give you a little heads up about uh, Caught at the Guthrie. So stay tuned and stay with us. Connections Radio Show is all about tapping into our hardwired hunger to connect. We examine meaningful connections to ourselves, our community, and the world around us. By opening the door to innovative insights by a wide variety of interesting guests, we'll make the connections to something bigger than ourselves. Join me, Lori Fitz, your host of Connections Radio Show, and together we'll make the connections. Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. on AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. Hello, humans. This is me, Ellie Krug, with Ellie 2.0 Radio on Monday mornings from 7 to 8 a.m. Our show this week is about idealists who unify. I'll talk about Larry Itlion, who helped unify California's Filipino farm workers in the mid-1960s with Cesar Chavez's Latino farm workers. The big interview will be with Brad Hart, the idealistic mayor of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Ellie 2.0 Radio, engaging and real on AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. It was a day like any other when she walked into my office and told me about Fearless Five Noir, a collection of five original short plays by five different writers and five directors, all on the same topic, noir. It just sounded so crazy that it was a hard pill to swallow, even for a hard-boiled detective like me. But I wasn't going to let that stop me. I knew exactly where I could find them, too. They'd be at the Mounds Theater at 1029 Hudson Road in St. Paul, They'd be there Fridays and Saturdays, February 8th through the 23rd at 7.30 p.m. Tickets would be 10 bucks if I planned ahead and ordered them online, or 15 bucks at the door. She told me that I could always find more information at fearlesscomedyproductions.com. I took the job, but are you up for helping me with this case? I guess we'll find out at Fearless 5 Noir on February 8th through the 23rd at 7.30 p.m. at the Mounds Theater. Presented by Fearless Comedy Productions. With all the convenient big box stores that sell appliances, why do so many Minnesotans choose Warner Stellion? Check online to learn that Warner Stellion is a Minnesota family-owned business for over 60 years. Warner Stellion sells more brands than anyone else, and our passionate specialists are committed to impressing you so much that you'll refer us to everyone you know. That's our mission here at Warner Stellion. Ask around, check us out online, and when it's your time to buy appliances, join over 300,000 Minnesota homeowners and choose the specialists, Warner Stellion. 
I'm Peter Rackler from the Eastside Freedom Library, and I'd like to tell you about an historic place on Payne Avenue, Brunson's Pub. Experience history and passion through the delicious menu, reflecting the East Side's diversity. The choices are limitless. Salads, sandwiches, burgers, and shareable plates. Visit Brunson's Pub at 956 Payne Avenue and grab a discounted gift card when you mention that you're an AM 950 listener or a supporter of the East Side Freedom Library. Be sure to check out Brunson'sPub.com. Joyous way to come back into the fourth segment of Connections Radio Show. Hi there, I'm Lori Fitz, your host. And I've got Rick Shiomi, who is the co-artistic director of Full Circle Theater. And he is also directing The Mikado. And he's doing that for the Gilbert and Sullivan Very Light Opera Company. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. Welcome. It's been a great conversation today. And I, I really appreciate how both caught... And uh, the Mikado challenge us to look at art in new ways. Absolutely. And and how you're bringing that uh, new perspective. Thank you so much. Because I I, I really, as a a theater artist, I really feel that uh, the importance of that uh, idea is that um, I'm working with uh, uh, a piece of art, the Mikado, that is 130, over 130 years old, um, and yet there is a way of adapting it um, that highlights the humor, the insight, the, the uh, uh, wonderful music uh, and clever lyrics, um, uh, and we can remove certain things from it, like the cultural baggage that, mm-hmm. that were problematic and, and now... Uh, uh, have become huge issues. Um, and then with Cot, which I'm directing for Full Circle Theater and producing it at the Guthrie, it's about the issues of truth and, and, and ideas of, of culture that are so important to us right now, today, in, in 2018. So I feel very fortunate as an artist to be dealing with both and hopefully, ideally, uh, helping to connect people mm-hmm. and audiences to artistic work that that can speak to them and help them both think and also uh, enjoy. What I I've been exploring in terms of thinking about connections um, in the last few shows we've talked about how connections is also about um, having a sense that we matter, and then how do we share that we matter together. And then how do we create meaning out of all of it? And our meanings may change over time. And I believe art uh, opens up our awareness, at least to the opportunity of new ideas. Uh, It stretches us. And both these pieces, Caught, that's going to be at um, the Dowling Studio, and it opens on May May 17th, 17th, and it goes to June 2nd, um, I think is a brilliant way of allowing ourselves to get lost and find something after we've gotten lost in it uh, that we may not have expected. So I I haven't shared, we haven't talked about the actual (laughs) plot because we don't want to. (laughs) want you the surprise. Exactly. We want you to go experience it, but we want you to have fun, but we want you to not get too frustrated at the thought that it's um, maybe going to challenge you to think in new ways, that maybe challenging you to think in new ways will be a more pleasurable experience than, than what you've maybe experienced in the past. I mean, because you can talk about cultural awareness, but it's not until you really experience it that that your own culture can um, inform you mm-hmm. uh, and figure out what are the ways that we connect. And mm-hmm. can we? Mm-hmm. Can we ask the question about are we really connecting? And how can we? Yes. W- what are the what are the ways that we can connect? And and what you and I feel are is, is that art can mm-hmm. be one of the ways yes. we can connect. An important part. Um, sometimes it's testing the way we do things. I, mean, I believe also radio can in new ways as well, that radio has evolved over the years and that there have been conventions in radio that I sometimes like to challenge as well. Mm-hmm. Um, how, do we, how do we bring art into radio? Can, can there be an artistic expression of radio? So with that, I want to make sure you all know about these two shows and how to go to them. Uh, as we said, Caught is uh, being produced through Full Circle Theater. So if we can go to Full Circle Theater, mn.org, M. you can get the tickets there. Yes. Uh, there's a 
ticket button there, um, but also you can go directly to the Guthrie Theater website and buy tickets on their uh, uh, website. And we're giving you a little advance notice because it's May, in May and June, so put that on your calendar and think about it. But something that's coming up a little sooner is the Mikado, and you're doing that for the Gilbert and Sullivan uh, light. Very light opera. Very light opera. <laughs> <laughs> and that's coming up in March. Yes, March 15th it opens. And uh, to get tickets there, we should probably give the website for that. I'm just going to pull up that website. That is GS, so it's Gilbert, Susan, uh, Gilbert Sullivan, Very Light uh, Opera Company. So it's GSVLOC.org. And people can buy tickets through there. Yes. Terrific. Uh, well, are there any closing thoughts that you'd like to have to talk about Full Circle and your mission there with the uh, as the co-executive, co-artistic director in, in bringing this kind of art to life? We really believe in the idea of intentional diversity, inclusion, equity. We really want to bring those elements together um, because... We have to work together. We, 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 it's it's uh, uh, the imperative of America, in a sense. Um, we are coming to grips with that. Um, we want to do it in a positive way. And, and we have this great adventure ahead of us, I think. Um, but we just have to be open to it. To pursue our happiness. <laughs> to pursue our happiness in such a way that honors, that we may find ways to be happy in a, a, a way that we didn't expect. Yes. And, and I think that both the Mikado brings a happiness as well as the, the cot. Yes. Uh, prepare yourself to be surprised, amazed, happy, uh, and thinking, which I think is a wonderful combination. Uh, with your theater move background, um, you move from having... Um, the Asian American experience to a wider scope. Was there a reason that you felt that was important? Um, I felt like uh, I had an opportunity uh, with Theater Moo to create something that didn't exist here in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were fortunately very successful, and many of those artists now are working all over the Twin Cities, all the Jungle Theater, the Guthrie. Mm -hmm. It's so exciting. Um, and Theater Moo itself has been very successful. Um, so I thought it was a good time to to change my adventure, mm -hmm. and and when I thought about what my adventure was, it was more for me of expanding uh, those connections to people, not just the Asian American community, but but uh, to a wider group of people. Well, thank you, Rick. I appreciate you coming today. Uh, I am an avid uh, supporter of Full Circle Theatre. I enjoyed going to listen to some play readings over at the Eastside Freedom Library. So to keep up with what's happening, not only check out their website, but give our website a take a look too. It's, it's connectionsradiomn.com. Also give us a like on Facebook and have a great week. We'll look forward to talking to you next week. Good morning. Welcome to Connections Radio Show, where we talk about ideas that matter. I'm glad you've made the connection and are with us today. I'm Lori Fitz, your host, and the goal of our show is to explore a wide range of topics that challenge us to see ourselves, our community, and the world around us that get us thinking, get us connected, and perhaps inspired or challenged to do a bit more because we've made the connection. Our topic today is about the Full Circle Theater and an upcoming performance. And I have Rick Shiomi, who is the co-artistic director, to tell us a little bit about that. Hi, Rick. Good morning. Hi. So glad you're here. Thank you. So tell me about this upcoming performance. We are producing a play called Caught by Christopher Chen. And uh, it is a play that we will be um, uh, opening May 17th. Uh, and closing June 2nd at the Dowling Studio of the Guthrie Theater. Um, we are so excited about this play because it is, uh, in my mind, a brilliant play um, dealing with issues of truth and in a very humorous and, and interesting way. Um, and uh, we are so fortunate to have, have this play to uh, produce. And you have an artist here from New York. Yes, we have uh, the key artist, Lynn Bow who is um, uh, going to do the opening uh, monologue um, uh, of the play. And uh, it's a part of it. the play begins or the production begins with an art exhibit 
done by Linbo, and then he gives an, an opening talk talking about his experience. And so uh, we're very fortunate to have him here uh, today to give uh, a part of that opening speech. Lynn, we're excited to have you share. So go ahead and give us that monologue. Mm. So I will begin. Um, well, my name is Lin Bo, and I am an artist. I know this sounds like an um, alcohol anonymous phrase, but in China, it is not too different. Because in China, it is not too easy to say you are an artist. Uh, take myself, for example. I was imprisoned in a Chinese detention center for two years because of a single work of art. I will, I will first try to say a few words about Chinese contemporary art. I say try because when I think about the China contemporary art scene, I cannot seem to see it clearly. You know, what was contemporary for me three years ago will, uh, will not be contemporary now. And in China, three years may render any community uh, unrecognizable. This fluidness will be uh, familiar to anyone who knows modern China. In Beijing, the most distinctive landscape feature is the construction site. Buildings are erected at the same rate they are demolished. A site of uh, rubble represents something coming up or going down, or, or maybe both. It is the cycle of life and death compressed. This pattern of the city enfolding and eating itself appears in the art world too. Uh, take for example, Art District 798 in Beijing, an art movement that transformed completely from the inside out. For those of you who don't, do not know, District 798 is a miniature city within the city devoted solely to contemporary art. At first, it seems like a, like a miracle in the heart of China's capital to see galleries upon galleries brimming with provocation, distorted sculptures of Mao, murals mocking the Cultural Revolution, but take a closer look and things are not as they first appear. Is this really provocative art? No. no. In truth, these provocations are smoke screens. In truth, it is not dangerous to poke fun at Mao in this manner anymore. It is in the official government-sanctioned history that mistakes were made in the Cultural Revolution. This is subversion light art. The real subversive artists, the original founders of District 798, have been ev long been evicted. In truth, District 798 is now a major government-sanctioned tourist attraction. In the end, this is, this is classic Mao. The appropriation of subversion to suffocate true subversion from within. Already there are plans for a, for a Las Vegas makeover with Cirque du Soleil style acrobatics. And when this happens, the transformation will be complete. So what was the single work of art that got you in prison? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, well first, uh, what can an activist artist do? Well... Lawrence Wiener made imaginary art. I decided to make an imaginary protest. The primary symbol of my protest would be a logo. I would appropriate the Chinese signature chop, which would read in big red calligraphy, Rally, June 4th, 7 p.m. Commemorate the dead. I would spread the logo through my networks, bloggers, graffiti artists. Uh, I would tell them to cover the city with the same image, the same call. Rally, June 4th, commemorate the dead. Rumors of a mass protest would 
spread far and wide. Everyone would be waiting to go, unaware of one crucial problem. Inside the logo, no location would be mentioned. <laughs> and so, on June 4th, 7 p.m., it all went according to plan. Hundreds, thousands of people would be glued to their computers, to underground websites looking for evidence of a mass protest. And so at the same time, across China, across, across the world, people would be thinking about Tiananmen's in, in unison. Guards might be dispatched to the square, not knowing we protesters have already joined together and, and the protests have already commenced. The logo went viral. On June 1st, three days to the anniversary, it spread through the activist blogosphere like lightning. I began seeing it everywhere. Protest, protesters, posters plastered, plastered on buildings, uh, stenciled on, on, on sidewalks. There was even rumors the government had taken notice. But I was not afraid. There was no real protest. There was nothing we could be caught for. Then on uh, June 3rd, 10 p.m., a knock on my door. I looked through the peephole and saw a young, anxious man. Help! I'm in danger, he said. I opened the door a crack. Lori, I should not have done that. <laughs> what was it like to be in prison? Well, I... I lived in a cell with murderers, rapists, drug dealers, some on death row, some with five kilogram shackles on their ankles. Some wore handcuffs too, chained to the ankle cuffs, forcing them to stoop so their spines curled like sh shrimps. Breakfast was watery milk powder with a rock hard piece of cornbread. Lunch and dinner was oily cabbage soup topped with a single boiled vegetable. Sometimes I did not have bowel movements for a week. Sometimes we poured food down the toilet and heard rats in the piping feasting. They lived off our discards and screamed if they didn't come, sometimes crawling through the toilet and we would chase them back inside. <clears throat> that is just horrific. Yes. yes. Can you tell me a little bit about the art that you're doing in your show to bring this to life? Of course, yes. I will be working on uh, two pieces, two pieces I've done. It's, uh, the two, first piece is of Detention Center 7, and the next piece is of uh, <laughs> my favorite meal there, cabbage soup. Mm. Now, now tell me a little bit more about this cabbage soup and why that was important to you. Well, to me, it represents the struggle and the, and the unfairness. And the loss of control. And the loss. I'd yes, have to imagine. The, and to mention, for, for all those in prison, for the wrong things, with, it, it, it is unfair for us artists to give away a luxury of a meal in order to serve a sentence of us speaking our truth. Have you had a chance to talk to other people about this experience, or is this one of your first times to be able to share with a greater audience what you went through? Mm -hmm. I, yes, I do have uh, connections in New York, but I am very excited, excited to spread the word here to the Midwest in Minneapolis. Rick, how, how long have you known uh, about this uh, incident and, and the challenges that, that he's faced? Only for about the last five years. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, uh, first came across this performance piece um, uh, several years ago and uh, was so impressed by it that uh, I actually ended up directing the world premiere of this performance piece uh, in Philadelphia at Interact mm -hmm. Theater. And I was uh, so pleased about that. And, and the reception was so wonderful that audiences just loved this uh, uh, performance piece uh, that 
they we were able to um, they got a number of uh, award nominations, mm. um, and this play uh, received uh, the outstanding play award for that year. Well, I want to encourage our audience to go see this show. Uh, to learn more about it, you can go to fullcircletheatermn.org. It's going to be at the Guthrie uh, up in the Dowling Center, and it opens again on in May. Uh, May 17th. May 17th and goes through June 2nd. So you know, contact either Full Circle Theater or contact the Guthrie for tickets. And it's a, it's an important show for all to see. Looking forward to seeing it myself. And we'll be right back after a few short announcements. Thank you for joining us on Connections Radio Show today. Uh, we're glad you've made the connection. Mm-hmm. 